You. Yes, you. Do you have a dog, cat, or hamster? Do you enjoy eating meat, dairy, or eggs? If the answer to any of these is yes, then you are an animal domestication enjoyer. But what is domestication? What does it mean for something to be domesticated? What have we already done this to, and can you domesticate an animal? A bear, perhaps, for self-defense. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea to me. All these questions and more shall be answered. Just let me explain. What better way to start our discussion about domestication than with its definition? Domestication is a sustained, multi-generational, mutualistic relationship in which one organism assumes a significant degree of influence over the reproduction and care of another organism in order to secure a more predictable supply of a resource of interest, and through which the partner organism gains advantage over individuals that remain outside this relationship, thereby benefiting and often increasing the fitness of both the domesticator and the target domesticate. Okay. That had some rambling scientific jargon in there, so let's break it down. The first bit here just means that it's a long process over multiple generations of at least the domesticate, but really both the domesticate and domesticator. And yes, this definition does not specify humans and animals, and instead uses domesticator and domesticate, to leave open the possibility of non-humans domesticating something. There is a theory that this is actually happening between the galata, a type of baboon, and the Ethiopian wolf, in a manner that mirrors our own domestication of dogs. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to the definition. The mutualistic relationship means that both parties are benefiting. This is in contrast to, let's say, a parasitic relationship, where only one party benefits and the other suffers. The next section is rather self-explanatory, and simply means that the domesticator has control over the domesticate in almost all areas of its life, especially breeding and care. The domesticator and domesticate will then have advantages over others of their kind that do not have a similar relationship, thereby making them more likely to survive and reproduce, and thus carry on the domestication process through the multi-generational aspect, as mentioned earlier. The control of reproduction is key in this definition, because it allows the domesticator to artificially select desired traits, often ones that promote submissiveness and reduce aggression in the domesticate for future generations. This corresponds with many physical changes of the domesticate to meet the needs of the domesticator. This can be as simple as making the domesticate look cuter, such as with floppy ears, longer attention of juvenile behavior, and coat color changes. However, domestication can change more than just cosmetics. It can reduce teeth size and number, change reproductive habits, which is the case for cows and goats with increased milk production, and chickens for vastly increased egg production, and the general decrease of total brain size and specifically reduction of the limbic system, which controls aggressiveness and stress-induced behavior. These different physical characteristics are what set domestication apart from taming. Taming is conditioned behavioral modification of an individual, which, as the definition says, happens to the individual animal, and so there are no differences physically or genetically to a wild individual of the same species. We can tame lions and tigers to control their behavior, but they are the same animal they would have been in the wild, which can lead to unfortunate accidents. In contrast, the domesticated dog very rarely attacks people, relative to their population, especially when the breed has been bred for home life, rather than defense, hunting, or dog fighting. So now we know what domestication is and how it differs from taming, but we are left with an interesting question. Why haven't we domesticated nearly everything? I mean, think about it. Wouldn't it be cool to have a pet giraffe or crocodile? Maybe a bald eagle that gets the mail for you, or a raccoon to find your keys. Even historically, there would have been incentive to have large predators like the big cats in times of war, so why not? Well, the reason is actually quite simple. There are six criteria a species must meet for domestication to be possible. These six criteria can be found in Guns, Germs, <laughs> and Steel by Jared Diamond. The first criterion is... It must be easy for the domesticator to feed the domesticate. The domesticate must eat easily attainable food, such as grass, which is everywhere, or scraps of food that the domesticator couldn't eat anyways. 
Potential domesticates that eat pounds of meat every day would be too difficult to sustain long term, because there's no way you'd see a return on that investment. So large predators such as lions, crocodiles, and bears are off the list. Also, if the animal has a very specialized diet, so that it only eats a specific type of leaf, for instance, then it would again be a net drain on resources to try to feed the thing. This criterion is of less concern today than it was for our ancestors. If you are an eccentric billionaire who can afford to waste all that money feeding a breeding population of these needy animals, but the average Joe Schmo and the ancient Joe Schmo could not domesticate an animal that doesn't fit this criterion. The second criterion is the domesticate must mature rapidly compared to the domesticator's lifespan. As mentioned earlier, domestication is a multi-generational process that requires selective breeding for desirable traits. But if it takes 15 years between generations, a person that starts the process at 20 years old would only have finished three whole generations by retirement at 65, which would accomplish almost nothing. So it would fall to dozens of human generations to get to anything resembling a domesticated animal, which is again, not sustainable or realistic. This is why, although elephants have been used extensively by humans for over 3,000 years, they have not been domesticated. Most of the elephants used throughout history were captured from the wild and tamed for human use, or come from just a few generations of being bred in captivity, which is not enough time for significant physical and behavioral changes. Elephants gestate for up to two years and take 10 to 12 years to reach sexual maturity, meaning that the turnaround is very slow for each generation. However, elephants are very smart, and thus can be trained for human use effectively without domestication. The third criterion is the domesticate must be willing to breed in captivity. Obviously, there can't be multiple generations of selective breeding if there are no more generations because the animals won't reproduce around the domesticator. The fourth criterion is the domesticate must be docile and not aggressive towards the domesticator. If the domesticate kept lashing out and hurting or killing the domesticators, no one would want to continue domesticating it. And it may be impossible with our current understanding to ever truly breed the aggression out of the animal if it views itself as above you, and that ties into another criterion we'll get to in a bit, so put a pin in that. This is the reason that the American bison and the zebra have not been domesticated. They both hail from less forgiving environments, the Great Plains and the African savanna, than their counterparts, who wound up domesticated, cattle and horses respectively. So they are more aggressive by necessity to survive there. Both have been tamed to some success in the past, but still proved too difficult to work with for meaningful domestication. The fifth criterion is the domesticate can't be skittish or panic easily. If the domesticate panics easily, it could injure itself trying to escape the domesticator, or it could actually escape and waste all the resources and effort that had been put into domesticating it before its escape. It's also very difficult to work with and try to get useful resources or labor from an animal that's scared of you. This criterion also ties into criterion three about breeding in captivity, because like millennials, the domesticates are not focused on having kids when they are always stressed. This is why the attempts to domesticate the extremely skittish gazelles failed so horribly. The sixth and final criterion is the domesticate must be able to conform to a social hierarchy with the domesticator at the top. All species of large domesticated mammals had a pre-existing hierarchy that humans could co-opt and establish themselves at the top of. This is one of the main roadblocks in domestication because many animals are solitary and so it makes it very difficult to establish ourselves at the top of a hierarchy that doesn't exist. Such is the case with the moose and bears. Many large animals will also never see humans as above them, even if they have a social hierarchy, such as the hippopotamus. The hippo has a hierarchy with a dominant male at the top, but we have never succeeded in establishing ourselves there. Well, now we know what it takes for a species to be viable for domestication, but how did humans actually go about doing it? Well, there are three main pathways for domestication, commensal, prey, and directed. The commensal pathway is undergone when animals benefit from being around and following humans, either by eating scraps the humans don't need or eating pests that were also attracted to human sites. In either case, the animals gain a survival benefit proportional to how tame and docile they are around humans, and the humans are largely unaffected. 
so really the animals domesticate themselves to reap the benefits that comes with being around humans. Notable examples of this pathway include dogs and cats. The prey pathway happens when humans decide to experiment with hunting strategies for long-term game management. Eventually, the game management turns into herding, and the control over reproduction leads to domestication. This is what happened to most livestock. The directed pathway is the culmination of what humans learned from the previous two pathways. Since we were now familiar with how domestication worked, we could use it to domesticate other animals deliberately for specific purposes. Most labor animals were domesticated in this way. So now we know how humans can domesticate animals, but that leaves us with the what. What have humans successfully domesticated in the past? Well, it just makes sense to start at the beginning. So here we are, in 13,000 BCE. It's cold and harsh. Every day is a fight for survival. Humans have not developed agriculture or civilization, and won't for another 5,000 years. And yet, they have a friend. Man's best friend, in fact, the dog. Yes, dogs are the first species to be domesticated, even predating the domestication of plants. They were originally a Pleistocene wolf similar to the modern gray wolf. As for an exact time, place, and reason for domestication, it gets a little muddy, and no one really knows because it was just so long ago. However, it was definitely in Eurasia, possibly Siberia, and it was at least 15,000 years ago, but it could have been as ancient as 26,000 years ago. The reason why is believed to have been to help with hunting, but as mentioned earlier, they were likely domesticated using the commensal pathway, so there wasn't originally a reason why they were domesticated. It was by accident on the human's part. Goats were the second animal to be domesticated, somewhere between 10 to 12,000 years ago, in the Fertile Crescent. They were originally Bazaar Ibex, and were domesticated primarily for food production, although the production of hide, hair, and horns was a useful addition. And they were domesticated using the prey pathway. The pig is special because it was domesticated from its Eurasian wild boar ancestor twice, thousands of years apart, but both times were for food production. It was first domesticated roughly 11,000 years ago in the Near East, and then again 8,000 years ago in China. It was likely the prey pathway, but may have been commensal. They do eat everything, after all. Sheep were domesticated through the prey pathway between 10 to 11,000 years ago in ancient Mesopotamia from the Asiatic Mouflon. However, it wasn't until 6,000 BCE that sheep were utilized for their nice fluffy wool in the production of textiles. Cattle from the subfamily Bovinae have been domesticated independently six different times from five different species across the globe for meat and milk production, and for their impressive mastery of pulling and carrying heavy things. The first domestication was through the prey pathway, but likely a few of the later species were domesticated using the directed pathway. The first domestication was in the Near East 10 to 11,000 years ago from the Eurasian auroch, and these cattle would go on to produce all the European cattle breeds. The Eurasian auroch was also domesticated around this time in China. The zebu, also known as Brahmin cattle, Indocene cattle, or humped cattle, was domesticated in India 8,000 years ago, from the Indian auroch. The guile, also known as the drung ox, or methoon, was domesticated seven to 8,000 years ago in India, from the wild gaur. Around five to 6,000 years ago, the water buffalo was domesticated in India, China, and the Philippines. The final cattle group that was domesticated is the yak in Tibet and Nepal four to 5,000 years ago, although recent genetic studies have given ranges from six to 12,000 years ago. So, who knows? Everyone's favorite feline was again domesticated twice from its wild ancestor, Felis sylvestris both times using the commensal pathway from eating mice and other pests attracted to human settlements. First, it was domesticated in the Fertile Crescent, about 11,000 years ago, and again in Egypt about 4,000 years ago. And we know this due to the genetic evidence of two source populations found in modern cats. The donkey was domesticated in eastern Africa 7,000 years ago from the wild ass, they were domesticated for their uses as a pack and work animal through the directed pathway. Around 4,000 years ago, in the Arabian Peninsula, the dromedary was domesticated via the directed pathway for food and hide, but mainly for their labor and transportation across the desert. There have only ever been two invertebrates domesticated by humanity, both as directed pathways. 
the honeybee, and the silk moth, or silk worm. The former was domesticated 6,000 years ago in Europe and northern Africa for the purpose of producing honey and wax. The latter was domesticated 5,000 years ago in China for ritualistic combat. Nah, I'm just kidding. It was for silk. The horse was domesticated in modern-day Kazakhstan around 5,500 years ago for work and transportation using the directed pathway. It was originally part of a now-extinct population of wild horse, maybe the tarpan or European wild horse. The llama and alpaca were domesticated from the wild guanaco and vicuña respectively, around 4,500 years ago, in modern-day Peru and Bolivia. They were domesticated via the prey pathway to produce milk, meat, and wool, as well as some light hauling of goods. However, they are too weak to have been used extensively as pack animals. Wow, there, uh... There's a lot more species here than I thought. We're only halfway through. Huh. Okay, here's what I'll do. I'm going to put up a list on screen now for the species I don't have time to cover. Pause the video if you want to read them all. And yes, I know it's unfortunate I'm not covering them, but the ones that are left are either very similar to previously covered species, or I felt they didn't make as big a contribution to history. Fight me in the comments if you disagree. Thanks for sticking around. If you enjoyed this video, please uh, domesticate that like button, and uh, tame that subscribe button, and maybe maybe a selectively breed the bell icon over multiple generations to repurpose it behaviorally and morphologically to suit you and your peers' needs. Nailed it.